How many people, when you walked in and saw the chairs arranged like this, heard that music in your head? All right, just like scary Halloween music, something's weird here. This is not church. We don't do church this way. How many people were here last week and did it? All right, so you're back. So no one was actually harmed last week when we did this the first time. So we're glad you're here at Crossman Church. My name's Michael, if you don't know me. I'm one of the pastors here. Pastor Suzanne is over at the other campus. Pastor Steven's here today. This is a different setup. It really is, and, and it can be scary when someone moves your cheese like that, right? You know, and you come in, and you feel slightly out of control. You don't know what really is going on, and so we're working on that, you know? But this is all about skeletons in the closet today. So don't be freaked out. Don't be freaked out by that, because we're not going to ask you to bury your souls. We really don't want to see that right now, okay? That would be truly scary for you and us, so we're not about your particular skeletons in the closet we're looking at common ones, okay? They're ones, they're ones that, like last week, was worry, and that was really helpful to a lot of people because there's a lot of us that are really worriers, and, and, and it becomes something that's, that's deep and dark inside of us, and we don't really know it's there till it pops up like a scary creature from a movie, right? And then all of a sudden, we're freaked out, and we act in bad ways from the skeletons that, that come at us that are deep and dark inside of us. And sometimes we're aware, sometimes not, Sometimes we run from them. We know they're there, and we just want to get away from that thing that's being triggered inside of us. So we all have skeletons in our closet, but we're going to talk about common ones today. Now, if you just showed up here today, a lot of people know the routine, but you might not. So here's what I want you to do. Pull out, everybody pull out this announcement sheet that you were handed at the door. If you don't mind, that bottom part actually rips off. So if you fold it, it's perforated, fold it, and on three, we'll all rip it. So are you ready? One, two, three, give it a good rip. All right. Now fill that out while I'm talking, while I'm chatting at you. There should be a pin somewhere in front of you in a little bucket. Also, if you have not done it already, there are name tags in that little bucket. Don't assume everybody around you knows your name. Please fill that out and put your name on the name tag, just your first name. Slap it on your chest, and that way we don't have to go, hey, you. We can actually talk with each other. So that's a good thing. So make sure you do that while I'm talking. Now, while you're filling that out, we're going to go over just a few things. Since this is a dialogue service, here's what we want you to know. This is what we do in our bar service, by the way. How many people have heard the term outpour while you've been here? A lot of people. It's actually a bar service that we put on, and what we do is we go into a local bar. It's Picasso's over on County Line. And we have a service on Monday nights that looks like this. We gather in groups around tables and we discuss topics because there are people that want to talk about spiritual topics but don't want to come to church. And so it's the church's responsibility to take that conversation out to them. And that's what we do. We take the, and they don't want to be talked at. You know, church, when you sit in church and you sit in rows, it's, it's just like someone talking at you the whole time. They want to join in the conversation. So we wanted our churches to share in this conversation, to see what it's like, what these people are coming to do on, on Monday nights at Picasso's. If you want to come to that, you can come to that. We would love to have you at Picasso's. There's a price, though, for admission. You have to bring one person that doesn't go to church anywhere. That's, if you want to come to that, if you're a Christian and you want to come to that, bring a person with you that doesn't go to church anywhere. And there's a few of us in here that have already done that and taken us up on the challenge. So thank you so much. And, they, and we have an invite cards out at the back table. So if you'd like to come and experience that on Mondays, it'll look a lot like what we're doing today. So you'll already be familiar with the conversation. It'll be great. And you get to bring your friend into that and help join in the conversation. The fun thing about this is it doesn't matter how many times you do it. When you're with different people, the conversation is different. And so it's always different. It's always different. But we have a few rules. Let's just agree just for agreement's sake today that this room is Las Vegas, right? What's said here stays here. Can we all agree to that? Nod your head yes, if you can agree to that. All right, so this conversation doesn't leave here unless it's specifically with the person you were talking with in the first place. That, can we all agree to that? That's good, that's a good, that's kind of a common thing here. What's said here stays here. But we have some rules of dialogue. The first one is open your mind. If you walked in here and you've got it all figured out already and you know what you're going to say and you know how you're going to answer and all those things, you're really doing nobody any good because this is just a story you put out all the time anyway. Open up your mind to what's coming at you and open up your mind to what God might be trying to say through you. So open up your mind. That, this is the opposite of it. Suspend judgment. Because when we judge people, we've already categorized them. We said you're this and you're no more or no less and I've put you in a box already. 
And so what you say doesn't really matter. What, what you think doesn't really matter because I've already determined how you are. So let that go. Just drop it. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do the person across from you any good. And it, and it closes off your mind. So suspend judgment. The other thing is listen to understand. So many times we're so ready to give an answer, we didn't even hear what was being said. This is me all the time. So listen to understand. If you don't understand what's, what somebody's saying, ask. Say, I, I think I hear you saying this. Is that what you really mean? And just ask for clarification. It's so easy to get a conversation going that way. The other thing is respect our differences. I can guarantee you there's not two people in here that think alike. And that are all coming from different points in the spectrum. And the cool thing is, is it's Jesus that brings us together. We don't have to think alike. Because the one commonality we have is a love for God and a searching for God. The other thing is, there's no experts allowed here. How many people here are fix-it people? Like, you got a problem, you come to me with a problem, I've got a solution, right? That's me. That's me. And, you know, in a heartbeat, that's me. You don't have to admit to it, but we know it's true, and your whole family is pointing at you right now anyway. All right? We don't need any experts here today. That's not what's called for today. What's called for today is understanding where somebody's coming from. Because I'm, I'm that person. You come to me and you start talking, blah, blah. I have to always watch myself because I want to go, well, what you need to do is this, this, and this, and this. And what it does is you've, you've just effectively cut them off because you said, you're dumb and I have a solution for you. Okay? So you've cut them off and judged them all at the same time. So you, they, they just need you to hear what they're saying. They don't need you to have a solution for them. So no experts. And here's the thing. For the, sh the timid among you, you get a pass if you want to. If you get to a question you're just uncomfortable talking about, you get to say, I'd like to pass on that one. And that's okay. You get to pass if you want to. And the other thing is, is if some of the topics we're talking about sometime, because in Outpour, we're going to talk about some really emotionally engaging topics, like some of the stuff you hear in political debates and things like that, some of the stuff like that, we're going to talk about those things. And, and a lot of people attach emotion to ideas sometimes. And so you get, a, you get to do this. If it gets too emotional for you or if it's getting, people are getting too amped up, you get to go, time out. I just like to call a time, everybody take a breath. And let's kind of try to uh, approach this a different way or move on to something else until we can catch our breath, okay? And that's okay. And these are just rules of dialogue, and it helps. And you know what? We barely engage half of these usually when we're in here. So just follow those rules. Can everybody agree to that? Nod your head yes. Nod your head yes if you can. If not, you can go and the kids are in there and go have fun with them, okay? So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about skeletons in the closet. And here's the thing we know about this, that all of us are haunted in some way, shape, or form. We have things that are inside of us that lurk inside of us that pop their ugly heads up sometimes. Some thoughts, some actions, some wounds, something inside of us that drives how we act and react to the world around us. We all are haunted by something. And this is a perfect time to talk about that. But here's the thing. God wants to do what we always want to do when we're in a dark and scary place. Flip the lights on. The Lord's light penetrates a human spirit, exposing every hidden motive. And that might sound scary. But here's the thing. God doesn't want to do it to hurt you or judge you or condemn you. He wants to do it so that you can be better. So that you can get past the thing that you think is so scary and ugly and dark. And when God shines his light on it, what it does is it helps us deal with it on factual terms. Not just on emotional or scary terms, but on factual terms. So, let's start with our own story today. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's just engage with somebody. If you guys just came in, if you, don't, if you want to find a group that you can kind of uh, engage with, so it's not just all with the same family, that's fine. If not, you can just talk to your own family, because sometimes we don't even know our own family story. Right? But you guys are going to spend a little bit of time here, and you're going to answer these questions. Who, what, where, and why? It's like a good newspaper report, right? It tells you all the facts you need to know. Who are you? What do you do, or what have you done? Where have you lived? All the places you've ever lived. And for military brats, it's like, oh my gosh, i got to start writing that down, right? And why are you at Crosswinds today specifically, but why are you here, period? So go ahead and share around your groups right now, and I'll tell you when it's time.
Keep it short. We only have a few minutes, so. Make sure everybody gets a chance. You got a, just a couple minutes left. One minute left, make sure everybody gets a chance to share.
Give you about 10 seconds to wrap up, please. All right, if I could get everybody to focus up here. I know your stories are so interesting. They're so interesting. Here's the cool thing that just happened that doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. Normally, like especially if you're new to a church, you come and maybe one or two people will greet you. People will be nice to you. That's great. That's awesome. Maybe even somebody will say hi on the way out the door, but you don't get to know anybody, do you? So what's cool that just happened is that you just connected with people you might never have connected with. We're told by Jesus that the two greatest commandments are to love God with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. How can you do it when you're staring at the back of their head? You can't. You can't do it until you form a connection with them. Until you start to get to know them, and they start to get to know you. But here's the funny part. We usually share the PG version, don't we? We share the Disney princess version, right? Everything's cool. It's fine. I'm with my loved one, and my children are beautiful. And I sing songs and bluebirds land on me, right? <laughs> That's the version we want to share with everybody. You don't want to see all the dark and ugly parts in my closet. You don't want to see all my skeletons and all that. We're, we, we're afraid to share that because we, we fear the rejection that might come with that, right? We fear the judgment that might come with that. And yet that's who we are. That's a real story, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're about here at Crossings Church is real life, real people, and real faith. We're about keeping it real, about being authentic. And our story includes some dark parts. You know, um, the Apostle Paul said this about our story. He said, you show that you're a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. God is writing a story on you and in you through you, and he's writing it on your heart. And so that means that everything that sits in your seat of emotions, your heart, all the darkness, all the light, counts. It's all of you. Your story matters. The good parts, the bad parts, the hidden parts, the scary parts. It all matters. And God wants to take that story and redeem it and tell a story to this world through that. But it's so hard because we're so scared. And we run away. It, it, it almost triggers a fight or flight instinct in us when we walk in and we, we have a topic like skeletons in the closet. And all of a sudden we're all facing each other. Right? Did you feel it? I mean, this is intentional in a lot of ways to kind of stir up emotions in you. And we even, we even dream. We dream. We're so scared we have like nightmares about it. I want to share one with you. This is a guy, and Suzanne found this, and it's amazing. This guy tells a story about how he fears things and how they cause him to bolt and want to run away. And it's a story. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit quietly and just close your eyes and pretend you're in this dream and that this is you. He says, in my dream, I'm a member of a counter-terrorist group. I wear dark camo a helmet, night vision goggles, a bulletproof vest, and black face paint, the whole deal. Now, before I go on, you got to know how comical this is, because in my non-dream life, I'm the kind of guy who would pet all the forest animals if they'd let me. And I'm freaked out by guns and loud noises. But back to the dream. Our group that I'm with, think SEAL Team 6, was going after the bad guy. Now, to reach them, we had to make our way through a dense forest and scale a steep, jagged cliff, which we did with both stealth and skill. It was nearing sunset. And as we reached the cliff's crest, we advanced towards the enemy camp. Suddenly, there was a huge explosion, followed by gunfire from almost every direction. They were waiting for us. The ensuing battle was fierce and chaotic. It soon became evident that we were being overpowered. Our only escape was to retreat the way we came, and somehow we made it to the cliff and scaled down it amidst heavy fire. The enemy followed us. Running furiously through the woods, we eventually fanned out, finding separate paths. 
a strategy we'd obviously learned in training. And as I was charging through the underbrush, I heard footsteps behind me. I had been singled out for pursuit. I could hear him running behind me, the leaves and the sticks under his feet crunching it as he followed. And nearing exhaustion, I kept running as fast as I could, but he followed me relentlessly. With limited visibility, I tripped over a root. And sprawling on the forest floor, my face in the dirt, in a moment, his footsteps stopped. And I realized that he had caught up with me. I turned to look at the face of the person who I thought would surely kill me. How many people here have ever had that story? That kind of dream where you're running and you're trying to get away and you're trying to get away and you're trying to get away, but you're just, you can't. As fast as you run, you're not going to get away from it. And it's catching you and you're so scared to turn around. That's what we're talking about today, maybe on an emotional level. But that fear that, that lurks deep inside of us that causes us to bolt and run sometimes does weird things to us. And we're going to talk about the things it does to us. And it creates skeletons in our closet. And so today, just kind of starting off, just to get us warmed up a little bit, I'm going to ask you a question. And we had a contest last week. And the winner of the contest got the skull of prizes. So today, I want one of you, someone who is, can write legibly. I had an engineer win last time, and it looked like mathematical symbols. Okay? So can write legibly and quickly. And I want you as a group, you get two minutes to answer this. And the winner, skull of prizes, you get to pick out of that. The winner will get that, but you're going to answer a question, and you're going to get two minutes. I'm going to time you. So as a group, you've got to work together. Somebody get the pen. Somebody get the card. Get ready to write. Here's what I want you to answer. Oh, let me get my little time clock out. Here's the question. What are the things we run away from? It can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be real, it can be unreal. What are the things we as people run away from? Go. One minute, one minute. Does it help if I go? Five, four, three, two, one. Stop, 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 stop. Lift your hand. Okay. How many people had 10 or more? Got to count them. Count them real quick. Count them real quick. Let me know. Okay, you had 10, you had 10, you had 10. Did you guys have 10 or more? You guys aren't scared at all. You're like, whatever. We don't run for nothing. <laughs> Who's got 10 or more? All right. Who's got 15 or more? Wow, we get some runners. Who's got 20 or more? 
Who's got 25 or more? Wow, 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 wow. You guys nailed it. Let me see this one back. Oh, I've got to bring you the school of prizes. You get to choose from the school. Okay. Listen real quick to this. Fear, anxiety, harm, school. I have no idea what that is. Barracudas, sharks, children. Children, you run from your children. Stress, police, love, loneliness, desolation, commitments, skeletons, doctors, dentists, teachers. <laughs> we run from our teachers. There was a lot of kids in that group. It's okay. Needles, mediation, uh, charge, work routine, independence, dependence, illness, truth. Something else. Illness. Something else. All right. Yeah. Okay. So you guys win. You got over 25. Thank, give you all yourselves a hand. Give yourself a hand. They won the group. All right. So what would happen? What would happen if the thing, if we found out that the thing we're actually running from, the thing that triggers that fight or flight instinct into us, was actually not what we thought it was? Let me tell you the rest of the dream. Close your eyes, because this is this guy's dream. And then I saw him. A kindly, old, little guy. About the size of one of Snow White's friends. Only with the cool factor of someone in the Lord of the Rings. About three feet tall, this fellow had long silver hair and a beard. He didn't look at me, but was busy spreading out a tablecloth over the ground. Then he brought out a large picnic basket and began placing plates and foods on the cloth. There were meats and cheeses and desserts and foods that I'd never seen, but it looked like if you ate them, your life would change for the better. He turned and looked up at me. And with the kindest of eyes, said with a gentle but firm voice, you've been running from me all your life. And all I ever wanted to do was give you a feast. So here it is. Enjoy. And that was it. I woke up crying and laughing, savoring every second of both the dream and the feast. Up until that moment, I don't know when my heart had ever been that full. It was a holy moment. It doesn't take Sigmund Freud to interpret my dream and from the conversations I've had with friends of mine. This dream contains a familiar theme. Our fears lead us to lonely and crazy places. We often run from the wrong things, and sometimes we end up fighting ridiculous battles, get this, against imagined enemies. Often what we fight or evade are the very things destined to bless us. Do you feel the turnaround in that? You know, I have a feeling sometimes, well, I just know, because God's done it to me over and over again, that sometimes that if we could just have the courage to stop and turn around and face the things that are triggering some of our deepest fears, that we would be blessed. Paul says we're God's masterpiece. He, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. But if we insist on running, if we insist on letting our own personal fears cause us to push away and scramble for all we're worth, which is how we operate most of the time, we never get to turn around and see the blessing. Because that turning around is just so scary sometimes to face. And truthfully, we really, really, a lot of times when that fight or flight instinct's triggered in us, we end up telling ourselves a lot of lies about what just went down. In fact, we're actually hardwired as human beings as part of our survival instinct to make up a story whenever we get that instinct kicked in. We make up a story about what just happened because it's, it's part of our instinct to survive, to say, this is good, that's bad, we can't do this, we should do this, I can be with this person, that person's safe, that person's dangerous. And so we make up a story, and most of the time, most of the time, those stories are just full of lies, and we never go back and examine the lie for what it was. 
and it becomes a skeleton in our closet that we haul along with us and we make up a whole storyline surrounding it. And we do this all the time. Suzanne and I have one of our favorite authors and speakers. Her name is Brene Brown. Do any of you know who Brene Brown is? Dr. Brene Brown. She's a sociologist and a Christian. And she does a lot of research into uh, shame and vulnerability, among all things. She's kind of an expert on those. She's actually done some TED Talks online. You can look her up, Brene Brown. She's got one of the, the top four ever watched te uh, uh, YouTube videos is her talk on shame and vulnerability. She's an amazing person. We saw this, we were blessed to see this. It was on an interview Oprah did with her and we were able to get the, the recording and we wanna share a little bit about this with you because Brene talks about this very subject, about the lies we tell ourselves. When we're really, we're triggered emotionally or we're scared or something bad happens or we're hurt. And we wanted to share this a little bit with you and, and we're gonna share what her solution to it is, what she's found. And she didn't just do the research to find out why it happens. She talks about how to get past it. So we wanted to share this with you. So just listen to what Brene has to say, Dr. Brown. Really the heart of this book is about these really dangerous stories we make up when we're in the midst of struggle, when we're in a fall. Um, we are neurobiologically hardwired to make sense of that fall, to make sense of our hurt as fast as we can. And if we can come up with a story that makes sense of it, our brain chemically rewards us for that story, whether it's accurate or not. And the most dangerous stories we make up are the stories that we make up about our lovability, yep. about our divinity, and about our creativity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the stories we make about, about our lovability, he left me, she had an affair. Um, and then all of a sudden, we make up a story that says, I'm not lovable. Yeah. When you fall, the stories you make up about your fall need to be really tested. And so as I was writing it, what I realized was that my stories of failure and heartbreak were the ones that gave me the most access to understanding what was happening behind the scenes in the story. Mm. Because we all do it. We all do it. I mean, if you and I finish this interview and we walk down the hill yeah. and I say, thanks a lot, Oprah, I really appreciate it, you go like this, My brain takes yeah. that as anxiety or fear, and I immediately make up a story. I knew she never liked me. <laughs> I, that, that, that Super Soul Sunday really sucked. <laughs> I didn't do the right thing. It was terrible. Um, and then all of a sudden, I have a, I'm working off a whole narrative. How I treat you the next time I see you is off that narrative. Um, wow. And then, you know, it just keeps going and going. Do you feel it? Do you, do you feel what she's saying? Is that not just pure truth and wisdom right there? That's exactly what we do. It's, it's happened to me three times this morning. I catch myself doing it. I catch myself when someone gives me a bad reaction, and it might not be, they just could have gas. It doesn't matter, right? Oh, that, man, that person's mad at me this morning, or they're just being a crabby little, you know, so-and-so, or whatever, right? I mean, we do it, and then we make up a little story about it, but the thing is, the thing is, we, it, it, we, the stories are lies most of the time. It's just we're hardwired to do it. It's, so it's such a common skeleton in our closet that we carry this load of lies with us. And we're actually kind of in many ways held hostage to it. We're held hostage to it. And we're not supposed to be people that are captive. We're supposed to be free in Christ. Paul says this, he says, you know, we live in the world, we don't wage war, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And that's what these lies become in our hearts. They're strongholds. What'd you say? Lies about my lovability, my divinity, my creativity. That's the, that's the lies we tell ourselves sometimes. 
And so we have to learn as Christians that we need to address it. We need to break up the strongholds in our lives. That's exactly what God wants us to do because it's hard for us to write the story he wants us to write or that he knows we can write if we're always hostage to the lies in our head and in our hearts. And so Renee says there's three things you need to do. And they all start with R. And so we're going to talk about them a little bit today. The first thing is reckoning. When something happens, most of us are just emotionally unaware. Let's just go ahead and throw that out there, right? We live in a town full of engineers. A lot of us are emotionally unaware, all right? We just are. And, and because most of us, when we were young, when we got emotional about something, we were told to put that mess away. Suck it up, sweetheart, right? We're moving on. Right? We were told to squash our emotions and move away from them. And so we never get curious about emotions. We're just like, ooh, bad thing. I'm running away from that. Right? And, and what she says is you have to become aware of your emotions. There's such a thing as an IQ. You know what that is? An intelligence quotient. You're kind of born with your ability to learn. And you have a certain ability to learn that can kind of measure that. But there's also an EQ, an, an emotional quotient. How emotionally aware are you? And she says we have to start working on our emotional awareness. If we're ever going to follow the commands of Jesus and love our neighbors ourselves and love God with everything that I have, then I have to start becoming emotionally aware. And she says, the first thing you need to do is just get curious. Whenever I feel my buttons being pushed, I have got to stop and go, hey, what is that? Instead of making up the story, going to my crazy story, I have to, I have to start figuring out what was that that just happened? Because I know when it happens because I know when I'm hooked, right? <laughs> Do you not know when your buttons have been pushed? A lot of us know it, but we don't know. You know when I know mine are pushed? You know when I know that I'm mad and Suzanne just stepped on my toes and pushed all my buttons all at once? You know why? Because I'll go and fold laundry. I'll fold it like a demon. I'll go and work on anything I can find to work on because when we're hooked, we want to let go of that energy, right? We want to bleed it off somewhere. Some of us go find someone we love and yell at them. Because we just felt like crap, and so we're going to make you feel like crap, right? We'll go find something that, we'll find something to yell about, right? We do it to our kids, we do it to our spouses. Some of us, are, what Brene Brown says she does, she goes, and, she goes and forages in the pantry for carbs, right? Potato chips, right? Because it's a way to let go of the energy, isn't it? And so, when do you know you're hooked? Because that's the sign when you need to stop and get curious. And it is like, it's a skill that we have to learn. And it's one of those things that you have to discipline yourself to do. So here's what I want you to talk about in your groups. What are the signs that you're hooked? Do you forage for carbs? Do you go have a glass of wine or six or seven or eight? What is it? So what are the signs you're hooked? Go ahead and talk. You're only going to have about another minute on this, so go ahead. Make sure everybody gets a chance.
about 30 seconds. Make sure everybody gets a chance. Real quick, just tell them when, tell them when you know you're hooked. Ten seconds. All right, let's focus up here. So that's it. That's that's it's so easy, but it's so hard at the same time because it's something that happens like almost immediately, isn't it? And you're so mad sometimes you you don't even take the time to think. You just go act on it to get it out. Right? You do. We all do it. We all do it. I do it all the time. And, you know, unless you start to become aware and start to go, you know what? I, I need to know where this is going with this. And she says the next thing you need to do is you need to fight with it. You need to rumble. See, uh, most of us, we don't fight. We don't fight with it at all. We just tell the story to ourselves and move on. And then every other decision we make after that is based upon the lie I just told myself. How I categorize you, how I judge you, how I'm thinking about myself, how I judge myself, how I think about God. What they said, you know, your creativity. We start to tell ourselves that story, don't we? I don't have anything to give. I don't have anything to add to this. I'm not good enough, right? That's one of the lies we tell ourselves. Or our divinity. I'm horrible. I'm sinful. God could never love me. Don't we tell ourselves that? Or our lovability. No one wants me. I'd never fit in. No one could love me. And we tell ourselves these lies. And we never fight for the truth. And you know what Jesus says? He says, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. In fact, I came to be the way, the truth, and the life. And when you see that in me, and you start to realize what you are, that you too are a child of God, that you are loved above all things, and that these lies that you're telling yourself only diminish you. That you need to find out what the truth is, and the truth will set you free. But you've got to lean into it. You've got to have the courage to turn around and say, what just happened? And what lie am I making up right now? What am I making up in my head? What is my crazy story right now? And where will that lead me? And what is the real truth here? She says you've got to ask three things. You've got to ask, what do I need to know, know more about this situation? What do I need to know and understand more about this situation? What do I need to know and understand more about myself? And what do I need to know and understand more about the other persons that are in my and you have got to start digging in and start leaning in. And what you're going to find out is that the, the, the lies that create the skeletons, if you turn and you face them and you shine a little truth on them and you shine a little light on them, they fade away from nothing. And you realize, start to realize it's just a crazy story I'm telling myself. And I don't have to buy it. I don't have to incorporate it into who I am. So here's the question I want to ask you, and this one's a little heavy. What's the biggest lie you tell yourself? What's your biggest crazy story? Where does it live? What's the one you tell yourself all the time when you get your butt kicked? Talk about that for a minute. Bring it loose.
Just about another minute, minute and a half. Make sure everybody gets a chance to share. About 30 seconds. got to finish because we're running a little bit behind. I want you to look back on that back wall back there. If you can see, they're panning across Madison. They're doing the same thing, so they have the same uncomfortable looks on their face right now <laughs> that you do. I know this is hard. I know it. I know this is difficult, and I know these are things that we have to face, but at Crosswinds Church, what we're trying to start with your life is a revolution because it's what God wants to do with your life. God wants you to have a revolution in your life. God wants to flip things upside down and make it too uncomfortable to go back in the other direction. God wants you to have a life that's free from, that, that you're not hostage. You're not hostage to the strongholds anymore in your life. You're not hostage to the lies you make up or that you tell about yourself or that someone else helped you tell. That you're not hostage to your wounds. He wants to start a new thing with you. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation is gone. The old is, is gone, and the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. When, when Nick stood up here yesterday or last week, and we baptized him, it was a beautiful thing, because we were over in the Madison campus, and right when we were finishing up, we saw it on our screen. And we were able to put it up on the screen, and we said, hey, let's just stop and watch this. And everybody cheered over there. Because it was such a beautiful kind of holy moment. Because it was a moment when Nick was signifying that the revolution had begun in his life. That he was coming down and he was dying to the old self with its lies and its wounds and its hurts. And he was coming up a new creation. And he didn't have to buy into the mess anymore, the lies anymore. That, that God was willing to die to undo all of that. And he's willing to be uncomfortable and lean into the hard things so that he can be all he is meant to be, so he can start having the truth come out in his life so that when God and him partner up and start to tell the rest of the story of your life, that it's a beautiful story. So that at the end of his days, when, when people stand up and they remember who and what Nick was at his funeral, that they have this amazing story to tell about him. What a beautiful man he was. What a great heart he had. How many people he affected. How many lives that because he was a man of God were changed. So that's the question I want to leave you with today. And I want you to go home and take this one home. We'll run a little bit over because we've talked so far. What do you want told at your funeral? What story do you want told? Take that home with you. Think about that. What story do you and God want to tell about your life? What is the thing when someone stands up to eulogize you at the end of your days that you want to say? You know, I, I want people to say, you know, Michael lived his life unafraid to walk with God. Unafraid to be everything that God asked him to be. Unafraid in that because of that courage that God gave him, he didn't have it on his own. Because of that courage God gave him, lives were changed. People got, took hope from that and said, you know what, I can have that relationship too. 
I can have a real relationship with God. And no lies and no covering up and no putting on any show. But I can just be me. And I'm worth it. And God loves me. And I can be the child of God that I'm destined to become. I want that said about me in my family. What story do you want to tell? Post it on Facebook today. Go out there and say, you know, today, I just want the world to know this is the story I want me and God to tell. Dr. Brown says, he or she that's willing to be the most uncomfortable will rise strong. But you have to lean into it. Discomfort is the way home. God was willing to die for it to make it a reality for you. Are you willing to lean in and let his spirit really start to work on you? Are you willing to lean in and let him shine the light on all the dark places so you don't carry that baggage around anymore and that you can undo the lies that are being told every day? God wants to tell such a beautiful story with your life. And we want, as this church, to help you realize what that is. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. We're going to take our offering here in just a second. I want you to look at the back of your connection card on here. Part of this is, seriously, is becoming just aware emotionally. We are such an unaware.